I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Slip through my fingers. Thank you, thank you, thank
Good morning. to lift up the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's our job today, and so let's, ask, let's pray and ask the Spirit to uh, speak to our minds and hearts this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. We don't deserve it, and you give us your love. And then you allow us to, to come here together uh, to lift up your name. So I do pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our minds, speak to our hearts. Lord, not that we just kind of check off the Sunday morning box, but that we lift up your name, that we worship you, that we are engaged when we're singing the songs, when we're speaking the uh, creeds, when we're hearing from your word. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for those that can watch uh, online and pray that that technology would work strong. We love you, Lord. We come here to give you praise and thanks and glory and honor. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Psalm 2 is our call to worship this morning, and I invite you to stand. Don's going to lead us in, in it. It'll be on the screen. Let's stand and call to worship by God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord holds them in derision. And then he will speak to them in his wrath, and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As for me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, 
and dashed them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Please we greet one another, and uh, as the band comes forward, and we get ready to sing praise. <laughs> <laughs> It's always nice. Yeah, I know. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sing praise to the Lord.
man, you made me see it. The scriptures in 1 John tell us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. Let all those forgiven in Christ shout, Hallelujah! Some of these folks out here, they, they might know. All right? But it, it talks about a wise man, and it talks about a foolish man. All right? So the first part goes like this. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Can you really that? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. Good? Okay, so now we're going to go. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. That's good news, right? Now, Let's listen to the foolish man. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. 
filling foolish man filled his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down the same part. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went flat. Well, it can't really sink because water and sand makes it. Well, it sank, it went flat. Alright, so what do you want to build your house on? You want to build it on sand or rock? Rock. Rock or dirt? Yeah. Brick. Okay. okay, well, for the sake of the song, rock. Alright? Now, there's a verse that I, I'm not sure if I ever heard, and maybe maybe the people out here never heard it either, but it, it says, you, you're talking to someone, you say, So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. Blessings down, prayers go up. The blessings come down as prayers go up. The blessings come down as prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your life on the Lord. Why? Because if you don't, you will go and you will go slack. Yeah. Okay, Jesus is the rock. He's the sure foundation. Okay, can you guys remember that? Jesus so, God. the wise man builds his house on what? The, the rock. rock. What's the foolish man build it on? Sand. Sand. So, our lives are sort of like a house, and we want to build it on Jesus, because he is a solid rock foundation. Can you remember that? All right, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for these kids, and I thank you for this congregation, and I, I pray, Lord, you would speak to all of us through that song and through the word today, and I pray that these kids would build their house on you, the solid rock, so that they are never separated from you, so that they are in heaven with you one day, but they are with you now as well, Lord, and they are, are able to get wisdom from you and your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, James got some stuff for you. Well, now you know the intro to the sermon. I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, we're going to look today at verses 1 through 8. Turn to Revelation 6, 1 through 8. And before we read that, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for... This time of worship, Lord, 10,001 reasons to give you praise and glory and honor. And, and Lord, that other song, we probably more often than not are on the road marked with suffering. Rather than when the sun shining down and the world's all as it should be, but whichever one of those we are in, Lord, I pray that our heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. And what a hard truth we sang, Lord, that you are the one that give, and you are the one that takes away. And Lord, today we're going to hear that you are the, the sure foundation. Oh Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from your word. Not what I have to say, but what you have to say from your word to your people. The same Holy Spirit that, that gave the vision to John and Inspired him to write it down, Lord. The same Holy Spirit speaking to us today. I do pray the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are my rock. You are my redeemer. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Revelation 6, 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. 
I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over, over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, some of you I could hear remember that song. Maybe you sang it when you were a little kid, like we had up here. The wise man built his house upon the rock, the rains came down, the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. The Why foolish man built his house on the sand. The rains came up, the floods came down, and the house sank or went flat. And then the exhortation to us to build your life on the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the firm foundation for the individual believer. And he's the foundation for the church. Our closing song later this morning is going to be the church's one foundation. Reverend Sam Stone wrote that in 1866. Our hymnal doesn't have all of the original verses. Supposedly there's seven. I could only find six anywhere. And there's several images from the book of Revelation in that hymn. Listen to the lyrics. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one over all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. When holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace and due. Though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. The church shall never perish. Her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those who hate her and false sons in her pale, against the foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and thy great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. Did you hear some of the images in that hymn, in that poem? It talked about oppression 
It, it talked about schisms or splits in the church, usually on an issue of truth. It talked about heresies or false teaching. It talked about those who hate the church. It talked about false sons or sheep in wolves' clothing. It talked about toil, toil, tribulation, and war. It talked about a bunch of stuff that you would not make it through if you were not on the foundation of the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today's text in Revelation gives us a, a picture of life as it has been in a broken world since the Garden of Eden. We see what has been, we see what is, we see what will continue until the Lamb comes again. And the only way that you and I can make it through that is with a solid foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation that holds his people through the trials of life. Make sure your foundation is the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ now and for eternity. He is the foundation that holds his people through the trials of life. Make sure your foundation is the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ now and for eternity. I want to start out with a brief review this morning. Then we're going to look at the four horses that we read about and then ask the question, what is your foundation? First of all, to review, we started back in January with the book of Revelation. And, and in chapter 1, we, we realized that this is an unveiling. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The unveiling of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're told that this is a book of prophecy. It's a letter. And it is apocalyptic literature, much like Zechariah, Ezekiel, and parts of Daniel in the Old Testament. And in chapter 1, we're given this incredible vision of the risen, exalted Lord Jesus Christ. Chapters 2 to 3, then there are these letters to seven local churches. They're all located in the current country of Turkey. And those seven churches are given a bunch of encouragement, a bunch of things to work on in the power of the Holy Spirit. Things like being on fire for Christ, don't be lukewarm. Things like getting rid of idols. Things like not compromising with the culture. Things like being faithful unto death. And then in chapters 4 and 5, John's given this, this incredible vision into the throne room of God, so to speak. And it's a vision of the creator and the redeemer, the one who sits on the throne and this slain but risen lamb. And the one on the throne is worshipped. And the slain lamb is worshipped. And the one on that throne holds a, a scroll that we talked about being the, the complete history of this judgment of sin and redemption. And no human being is worthy to open the scroll. And it causes John to weep, but he's told, no, 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 don't weep. There is one that's worthy to open it. And the one that's worthy to open it is the Messiah, the victorious, slain, and risen Lamb, Jesus Christ. That's a brief synopsis of what we've looked at in chapters 1 through 5. Now in chapter 6, in the vision... The lamb starts to open the seals and the scrolls start to be open. Now, I want to step a little bit aside here and mention about interpretation of Scripture. And, and hopefully no, none of you will shoot me with arrows or, or walk out. The most popular interpretation of the book of Revelation is what the scholars would call the dispensational view. If you turn on Word FM, if you buy a commentary, if you watch a Christian show on television, probably nine times out of ten, they're going to talk about the book of Revelation from a dispensational understanding. 
But what you need to know is that as far as interpreting the book of Revelation, the dispensational understanding is the new kid on the block. That interpretation didn't even exist until the 1800s. It was popularized in the Schofield Reference Bible. It was popularized in the teaching at Dallas Seminary. And as I've already mentioned, most people you will watch or listen to will tell you this is what this means, and they're coming from a dispensational understanding. In the dispensational understanding, the opening of these seals begins a time of what is called the Great Tribulation. And in the dispensational understanding, this Great Tribulation happens after the Church of Jesus Christ has been raptured or taken away out of sight with Christ until he comes again to earth. Now, we've talked about this over and over in our Tuesday Bible study. This is the study of eschatology. You don't need to know that word. It's a 50 cent word that means the study of the end times. And your view of eschatology or the end times is not an essential of your salvation. The essentials of salvation are that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He rose again. He bodily rose again. He is the God-man who will come again. And he's the only way to salvation. United in those essentials, we can be brothers and sisters with those who have different interpretations of eschatology. Why are you telling me all this boring stuff, Pastor Jefferson? I'm telling you all this boring stuff because we, and by we I mean the Reformed Church, the Presbyterian Church, are, are not dispensationalists. So while that is the most popular understanding, and I appreciate so much those incredible brothers in Christ, J. Vernon McGee, David Jeremiah, Robert Jeffress, they are brothers in Christ because we are essentially united. But their view of eschatology comes from the dispensational understanding. I'm not coming from the dispensational understanding. And if you want to know why, we can talk about that. I believe it has to do with exegesis, taking the explanation out of the text, rightly dividing what God's worth of truth says. And as I do that, I don't come down on the dispensational perspective. And that's okay. I can be brothers and sisters with a dispensationalist because guess what? In the end, they all end up the same. Jesus does come back. And we need to be ready for it. So having said that, my, my side is over. I see Revelation not as a, a puzzle book, but as a picture book. And rather than the seals starting tribulation, I understand them to be a picture of tribulation that has been, that is, and that will continue to be until Jesus comes back. And the only way that you and I can go through that is if, the, in the language of Psalm 2, in the language of our call to worship, we serve the Lord with fear and trembling. We kiss the Son and take refuge in him. So let's look at these seals. We talked about the scroll being the, the total plan of judgment and redemption. And that Jesus, the risen, crucified lamb, is the only one eligible to open them. And he opens the first one, and it's a white horse. Verse 1, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. Now just a little bit of an explanation here. If, if you were reading the King James, it would say, Come and see. And, and you read that and you think that the, the person, the living being, is, is talking to John. But most Bible scholars agree the word there, ergo my, come, would be better translated as get going. Get going. 
So the living being is not talking to John saying, come. The living being is talking to the, the horse, the rider, the judgment. Get going. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come or get going. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown. He rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Do you want to have fun? Get a stack of commentaries on the book of Revelation and read about this white horse. Half of that stack will say, this white horse is Jesus. In Revelation 19, Jesus is on a white horse. This is a white horse. The rider is Jesus. Half of that stack of commentaries will say, no, it's not Jesus. It's an imposter of Jesus. It's the anti-Jesus. It's the anti-Christ. Now, that's a pretty big difference, isn't it? One commentary saying this white horse is Jesus. One commentary saying this white horse is anti-Jesus. What do we do? We always want to interpret scripture, let clear scripture interpret more unclear scripture. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. In addition to that, in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, apocalyptic literature, guess what? There's different colored horses in chapter 1 and chapter 6. Read it this afternoon. And in chapter 1 and chapter 6 of Zechariah, these different colored horses are heavenly beings doing the will of the Lord. In Zechariah, they are patrolling the earth. Jesus or anti-Jesus is confusing. We don't serve a God of confusion. We have seen in the Old Testament heavenly beings doing the will of the Lord that are different colored horses. My conclusion then is this white horse is a heavenly being sent out to do the will of the Lord. In this case, judgment. And because the horse is going out as a conqueror bent on conquest, I would say it's a heavenly being representing a lust for power. And don't we see that from the very beginning? Don't we see that in the Garden of Eden? When Satan whispers to Eve, did God really say? You sure you can trust him, Eve? And you and I know that Eve and, and Adam failed that test. But the second Adam, another name for Jesus Christ, passed that test with flying colors. When he was in the wilderness, the same Satan said, bow down and worship me. And the devil, or Jesus told the devil, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. We live in a world full of lust for power, which leads to seal number two, the red horse of bloodshed and war. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, or get going. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. This goes way back too. Did you know that we don't even get five chapters into the Bible when we have our first murder? The Lord said to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. The world that you and I live in has people with a lust for power, and it causes bloodshed. And without a firm foundation, you and I will be destroyed. Bloodshed and war always leads to famine, horse number three. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the, living, the third living creature say, Come, get going. 
I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and wine. How many of us, I know I do, go to West Virginia or Ohio to get your gas? Because you and I both know that gas should be, at most, about $1.95. But it's three seventy four dollars or higher. Biblical scholars say this is indeed what is described here in Revelation. Incredible inflation leading to famine. Now we are reading out the NIV translation. The NIV interprets as it translates. Instead of denarius, it says daily wage. Biblical scholars say the normal price of wheat and barley is around 8 to 16 quarts for a daily wage. Here in Revelation, it's one quart a week for a daily wage. It's three quarts of barley for a daily wage. Scholars say that is enough for one person. The daily wage is only going to feed you. So forget about gas for the car. Forget about the cell phone. Forget about the internet. Forget about Kennywood and the beach. Oh, unless you're rich, it won't affect you. Oil and wine, luxuries for the rich. Make sure they're still available. Do not harm the oil and the wine. When you are in famine condition, you generally do not take good care of yourself. And the war that causes the bloodshed, that causes the famine, of course, leads to death. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, or get going. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Now, the Greek word there is, is chloros, from which we get chlorophyll. So it's a, a greenish, yellowish, sickly death color, translated in the NIV as a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sore, famine, and plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. Using scripture to interpret scripture, we realize that those four things, sore, Famine, pestilence or plague, and wild beasts are the exact four judgments that the Lord mentions in Ezekiel 14. In other words, we saw all of these things in the Old Testament. We see all of these things every day, don't we? The lust for power, war, bloodshed, famine, death. And they're overwhelming, unless you have a sure foundation. Did you notice something else as I read that read this to you? The white horse was given a crown as his lust for power went out. The red horse was given power to take peace. The red horse was given a sword in which to inflict violence. The pale horse was given power to kill by sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. Who is the one giving them these things? It's the one who sits on the throne and the lamb. These are the judgments for rejecting God as God. Romans 1, 21 to 23, do you remember that? Where the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this. They knew God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We are seeing in Revelation 6, 1 through 8, 
a picture of God's judgment on those who refuse to honor him as he is due. He is the one supplying the heavenly horses with the power to do so. Which means these judgments have no power apart from God. Which means if we know God, which we can through Jesus Christ, he will see us through the trials of this life. If we, in the language of our call to worship, serve the Lord with fear and trembling, kiss the Son, take refuge in Him, be covered by His blood, and put our faith in Him, we have a sure foundation that will take us through the trials of life until He comes again. So I leave you with this question. Who or what is your foundation? There's another great hymn, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Is your 401k going to take you through the trials and horrors described in this text? Is your ability, whether it's in sales or whether it's in athletics or whether it's in business, is your church attendance, your Bible reading, your Bible knowledge, is that going to take you through the trials of life that Revelation 6 gives us a picture of? Which Jesus referred to as birth pains. And he said these will continue and even worse things will come. Will those things take you through or are they sinking sand? They're sinking sand. The only sure foundation the only thing that will take you through the trials and the judgment on this earth of a broken, sinful world in which we live is the Lord Jesus Christ. All other ground is sinking sin. Who or what is your foundation? If it's not Jesus Christ, why not? What's holding you back? from placing your faith in him. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend. To guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those who hate her and false sons in her pale, against the foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. She, the church, shall prevail because her foundation is the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure yours is as well. Jesus Christ is the foundation that holds his people through the trials of life. Make sure your foundation is the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now and for eternity. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, we need you. We need you, Lord. We, we see around us every day bloodshed and, and war and famine and death. We see the judgments that you pour out upon those, the, the world that rejects you. And Lord, you so clearly tell us there's a refuge. There's a way through the trials of this life. It's Jesus. Lord, if there's anyone here today that would, would answer that question about the foundation of their life, if there's anyone in here that would say, my foundation, Pastor Jefferson, it's, it's in my, my own strength. Or it's in my own ability or my own ingenuity, or my own wisdom. Oh, Lord, I pray that, that today would be the day that they say, but I turn that, I turn that over. I repent, I turn from that. I want Christ to be the foundation of my life. Lord, I pray that today would be the, the day of, of salvation, and that, Lord, then a life of strength and solidness would be built on the foundation 
of you as the Lord and Savior of their life. Whether that's somebody here or that's somebody watching uh, weeks or even years from now. And Lord, for those that would say, yes, Pastor Jefferson, my, my faith is on, on the solid rock of Jesus. Oh Lord, cement those feet even stronger on that foundation. Teach us more about your infinite, amazing love that we don't deserve. And give us the courage then to share that with others. Lord, I thank you for each person here today. It's, it's not an accident anyone is here. You have drawn them here by the power of your Holy Spirit to hear your word. And the call goes out to find life, to find forgiveness, to find grace at the cross of Jesus Christ, the solid rock of foundation. Oh, Lord, I pray that no one would leave here without having you as the foundation of their life. By turning to you, accepting what you did on the cross to make us right, to take away our sin, to give us forgiveness, to give us mercy. And then their life will be built upon that. And Lord, maybe, maybe as the... Uh, Interpretation, I, I come at it, Lord, maybe maybe I'm wrong and the dispensationalists are right. Either way, we end up in the same place where you come back and we want to be ready. We want to be ready. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that we would be. And that we would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, do whatever is possible to make sure our family, our friends, our loved ones, our co-workers are also there. That they have turned to you and found grace, peace, mercy, forgiveness, and love. We need you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We respond to God's word in a number of different ways. One of them is to come to him in prayer together. We had a number of prayer requests in Sunday school. Um, a lot of traveling. Aaron and her family asked for prayers as they are traveling. There's others that are, are traveling. There are children and grandchildren that we were praying for. The young man that we've been praying for on the prayer chain, his name is Isaac. Uh, please pray for him as he continues to uh, recover from an a accident in the hospital. We pray for Robin and her continued healing. We praise God for the, the work that he's done in the life of, of Christian. And uh, Lord, we just pray for, or we ask you to pray for the uh, situations in this world, like in Aliquippa, where... There was a shooting recently, and a life was lost, and people are fearful. Are there other things you would like to lift up to the Lord this morning? All right. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Thank you, Father God. Thank you that you love us. If you just sent those judgments and hadn't taken on flesh and blood and, and dwelt among us and died on the cross and rose again and told us that we can, can know you, it would be completely overwhelming. We would be hopeless. But we're not. In a broken, sinful world where we see the judgment every day of rejecting you, Lord, you have said there's a way through this. There's hope, and that is through you. And Lord, we want people to know that. We lift up to you these requests we mentioned in Sunday school. There's a lot of them. There's some for healing physical bodies that have been broken. There's some for relational issues. There's some for travel. And Lord, there's some that weren't even mentioned out loud, I'm sure. Thank you that you are the, the same God that will provide the refuge for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, the foundation for our life. And then you will say to us, as my sons and as my daughters, cast your cares upon me. 
Wow, Lord, thank you. So we ask for you to take the cares of our, our daily life. We ask for you to provide for us. We ask for you to help us, to give us wisdom. Lord, we pray for those who serve our country. We ask for your mercy. We pray for those that serve as missionaries around the world and here in the United States. Lord, we pray for local leaders. And I pray, Lord, that the people will see that the answers that they're looking for is not in a law, it's not even in a lawmaker, it's not in a politician, it's not in an athlete, it's not in an actor or an actress, Lord, it's in you. I pray, Lord, that people will see you and come to live for you with peace, righteousness, and joy. Lord, I pray for our picnic tomorrow night, that you would draw people to you, and that they will see and hear of the love of Christ as we go out among our neighbors down the road. Lord, I pray for our preschool as things are beginning to gear up, believe it or not, Lord, for another school year. And little ones that will be uh, leaving home for the first time. I pray for the parents and, and those that are uh, involved with that. And pray for our teachers and helpers in the preschool world. Lord, we thank you and praise you that we live in a place where we can gather like this and we just ask, Lord, that your mercy would be upon us. And now would you hear us as we come together praying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Another way we respond to God's word is by giving of our time, our abilities, and the resources that he has given us in the first place. So I invite our ushers to come forward and receive the tithes and offerings given to message of Jesus may go out throughout Western Pennsylvania and throughout your world, and we pray that you would provide for every need of your people. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to uh, turn real quick to your handover happenings. Um, certainly, Terry, um, 
we have our, our, our sympathy on the loss of Shelly. And, and I'm so thankful to everyone that helped out with her memorial service uh, this past Monday. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board to do kids Sunday school for the rest of the summer. And we need some names on that. Um, there is a book that you can use, or as uh, Aaron mentioned this morning, you can just uh, look at a Bible verse or do a Bible story and sing a few songs with the kids. I think I saw them out on the playground today quite a bit. Um, just it would, be, it would be great to have someone that comes here saying, okay, if there's kids here today, I'm going to be in charge. Sometimes this summer there hasn't been kids, but sometimes there has been. So if you'd be willing to sign up, that would be wonderful. Tomorrow's our picnic at the Harsh Burger uh, Memorial Memorial Mogul Home Park. Um, a group of us went and passed out flyers on Thursday. There's a lot of new people in this park. There's a lot of new kids. Uh, so some of the people have not been to our picnic before, and maybe you haven't either. Um, if you go to the park, which is on 151, right beside the Community Bible Church, go to the back of the park, and there's a field back there. That's where we'll be. That's where the picnic will be. I hope you will come. We need side dishes. So uh, bring a side dish to share, like a covered dish dinner. And, and don't come and, and sit there um, with each other. Um, that, the Sunday night things that we've been doing are amazing for that. This is our chance to interact with the people that live in the park and share the love of Christ with them. So intermix uh, with them. Uh, that's tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. If you'd like to help in any way, we're going to meet here at 3.30 to load some tables and chairs and canopies and coolers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we'll probably be over there from about 4 o'clock uh, on. So any questions, let me know. Or Don, he's got all the answers to, to the picnic. Uh, that's tomorrow night at Hartsburg, Hartsburg Memorial Memorial. Mobile home park at uh, 6 o'clock. Next Sunday, we're going to the nursing home, which is called Lakeview, at 3 o'clock. Love to have you be part of that. You see on there that the uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship is having their Good News Day Camp, if you know anyone that might be interested in that. And if anybody's interested in joining with Hebron Church this Christmas for their Christmas cantata, uh, they are practicing already so that when the time comes, uh, they know what they're doing, and you're welcome to join in that. Am I forgetting anything? Sure. Uh, tomorrow, please take advantage of the senior food vouchers that they will be giving out at Independence Community Center from 11 to 1. Anyone 60 or older is allowed to get the vouchers. They are uh, five ten dollar vouchers so that it's fifty dollars to use at the local um, farmers markets. Um, Donalski's is one of them. Jadakinas is, is another. Shufflebine's another, and it gives back to the community farmers also. Um, the vouchers are free to you and free to you for you to use. Please take advantage of it. If you have any questions, grab me on the way out, and I'll help you as much as I can. But you know it's. For, it's there for you. Please take advantage of it. Yeah, take it. Ray, Ray Kramer was mentioning those to me as well this morning. So take advantage of those um, and see Charlene if you have any questions about those uh, fruit and vegetable vouchers. Thank you. Tom. Annual picnic at Raccoon. Yeah, we will be having our church picnic. Um, do you remember the date? Oh. September 12th. Um, at the Raccoon Creek State Park. Keep that day in mind. We'll have our service up there, Lord willing, outside. And then uh, uh, we'll play basketball and volleyball and eat and have a good time. September 12th. Rachel. Where is the Good News Day Club? Uh, I do not know. <laughs> um, yeah, go, you'd have to go on the website there, or there might be a flyer out there. But I'm sorry, I do not know where that actually is. The picnic is September 10th. Then? Yeah, the 12th is Tuesday. It just looks. Oh, okay. September 10th. Cool. Right. Whatever the Sunday is, it's the closest to the 10th, 11th, and 12th. It's September. Yeah, <laughs> that works. 
Let's stand and sing that great hymn, Church is One Foundation. <laughs> trials and the tribulations of this life so if it is not please make sure that your foundation of your life is the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ because all other ground is sinking sand and now receive the benediction Lord bless you and keep you or make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace Amen. Amen. Amen.